Will you join me in welcoming to the pulpit Dr. Victor Shepard? This is the third time I have been asked to speak to you in chapel in Greenville, and it is as great a joy and a privilege the third time as it was the first. The uh, topic of my sermon this morning is the congregation's ministry to the congregation, four essential aspects. First of all, a reading from the testament that anticipates our Lord Jesus Christ from Ezekiel 32, verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them, and the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I display my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And then from the testament that recollects our Lord Jesus Christ, first of all from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed through the living and enduring word of God. And finally, from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, Jesus says, If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble and tear it out and throw it away, it is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the hell of fire. Take care that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you, in heaven their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them <clears throat> has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. Thanks be to God for these readings from his own holy word. The congregation's ministry to the congregation. First of all, the congregation is a nursery for the newborn. Peter writes, like newborn babes, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation, for you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. <clears throat> when Peter addresses certain Christians as newborn babes, he isn't finding fault at all. He isn't saying that newborn babes shouldn't be newborn or shouldn't be drinking pure spiritual milk. In everyday life, nobody faults a baby for being a baby. Nobody faults a three-month-old because he isn't yet 30 years old. It's normal for a baby to be a baby and to be treated like a baby. It's wonderful to see a baby eager to drink milk. Several times in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus angrily denounces those who make things difficult for the little ones. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, says our Lord, it would be better for that person if concrete blocks were tied to his feet and he were pitched into the Mississippi River. 
Ten seconds later, Jesus, still upset, let's fly again. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. It is not the will of my Father in heaven that one of these little ones perish. The little ones of whom our Lord speaks over and over again and concerning whom he's so very protective, these little ones aren't five-year-olds. The little ones are adults. They're adult men and women who happen to be new in the faith. The little ones are adults, 30, 45, 60 years old, who, however, have only recently bonded with Jesus Christ. As old as they might be chronologically, they are yet spiritual neonates. They need milk, milk only for now, so that they may develop spiritually. Jesus never faults them for being mere little ones. On the contrary, he deems them so very precious that he guarantees the severest retribution to anyone who inhibits in any way the spiritual growth of the newest disciple. The babes in Christ have to be nursed, and the church in the first place is a nursery for the newborn. What do we expect from a nursery, from any nursery? What would you expect if you had children and were taking them to a nursery, well, you would expect, first of all, safety. Safety above everything else. You wouldn't leave anyone in a nursery for a minute if it couldn't guarantee safety. Now, I'm not belittling at all the bodily security and bodily uh, safety that has to be found in any congregation. But what I have in mind, chiefly this morning, is the safety and security of the integrity of the gospel. A congregation is safe, secure as a nursery for the little ones only if the gospel is preserved intact. Think of the most elemental confession found on the lips of the earliest Christians, Jesus is Lord. Early day little ones and not so little ones clung to this truth when Caesar is Lord was being screamed at them every day. When political authorities sneered, we'll show you who's Lord. We'll show you in the Colosseum where wild animals haven't yet learned that Jesus is Lord. We'll show you in the mines in whose damp darkness you're going to spend the rest of your lives. We'll show you on unpopulated islands where you're going to be exiled until you rot, like John Nasir. When this happened, our Christian foreparents could only gasp out three simple monosyllabic words. And centuries later, when it was announced throughout Germany that Hitler is Führer, the same faithful cry went up from the same faithful few. What those who dislike saying Jesus is Lord seem not to understand is this. To say Jesus is Lord is to say something about him, to be sure, but not only about him. It's also to say something about us who utter it. By God's grace, we've been admitted to truth. It's also to say something about the world. The world isn't the kingdom of God, but is riddled with falsehood, treachery, and turbulence at all times. In the midst of all the, the talk today about spirituality, gosh, I wish we'd give it up. I wish we'd return to talking about faith. We used to talk about faith. Faith always presupposes Jesus Christ as the author and object of faith. Jesus Christ fosters in us the faith which grasped him. All right, but if we're going to talk about spirituality, we had ought better remember that not all the spirits are holy. Unholy spirits are always ready to infest and infect. In many hymnals, the words of the old hymn, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, those words have been changed to, Jesus loves me, this I know, and the Bible tells me so. The change of wording indicates that Scripture is no longer the source and the norm of our knowledge of God. At best, Scripture can only reflect what we think we can learn of God elsewhere. This, my friends, is paganism. And it's spiritually lethal. The members of a congregation have to ensure that there's safety in the congregation. It's crucial that the congregation be a nursery where little ones are safe. Crucial that any congregation be a nursery where pure spiritual milk is kept unsoured and never cause a little one to stumble who have tasted the kindness of the Lord and want only to become spiritual adults. Speaking of nourishment, Nourishment is plainly the second thing we look for in a nursery. After all, babes remain in a nursery for quite a while. They have to be fed while they are there, or else they won't thrive. 
Babes don't get fed once. Babes get fed small amounts frequently. Babes get fed small amounts so very frequently that frequently amounts to constantly. They absorb nourishment cumulatively. The more they are fed, the greater their capacity to absorb. The greater their capacity to absorb, the more they are fed. Plainly, there's an incrementalism at work in the nourishing of babes. Let's remember that however sophisticated most people are, virtually everybody's sophisticated in one or more areas of life, more often than not, the same person is but a babe in Christ, a little one. The nursery has to ensure nourishment. As much as, safe, as a safety and nourishment must be found in a nursery, so must affection. Everyone knows of the experiments and the conclusions of the experiments concerning babies who were picked up and those who were left crying. Babies who were cuddled and kissed and cooed to and babies whose physical needs were attended to unfailingly. Everyone knows the difference it made to the babies at the time, and more tellingly, what difference it came to make to the, sake, to the same person, now an adult, years later. Everybody knows that affection warming an infant makes the profoundest difference eventually to the adult's self, the adult's self-esteem and self-confidence and resilience and adventuresomeness. It's no less the case in the nursery of faith. The babes among us have to be safeguarded. Yes, the gospel has to be preserved intact. And the babes among us also have to be nourished, but they also have to be always and everywhere cherished. Affection is as essential as food. The congregation isn't nursery only. In the second place, it's also a school where we are taught. Schools exist for teaching, which is to say, someone has to be taught and something has to be taught. Frequently we hear it said, faith is caught, not taught. It's said as if it were self-evidently the soul of wisdom, but it isn't self-evident, and neither is it the soul of wisdom. At best, it's a half-truth. The half-truth, faith is caught, is true in that faith is living relationship with a living person and not an intellectual abstraction. Faith is caught, not taught, is a half-truth true in that no relationship of person with person can ever be reduced to a proposition. But it's only a half-truth in that unless something is taught, in fact, unless much is taught, the person whom the truths describe can never be pointed to and commended and therefore can never be encountered and known. Those who insist that faith is caught, not taught, why do they never ask themselves why Jesus taught day in and day out throughout his earthly ministry? Jesus spent more time teaching than he did doing any other single thing. Shouldn't this tell us something? At the very least, it should tell us that events are not self-interpreting. No event in world occurrence is ever self-interpreting. Jesus could never merely do something and then assume that everyone who observed him took home the correct meaning of what he had done. Quite the contrary, he always assumed that people weren't going to take home the correct meaning of what he had done unless he told them. Prior to his death and after it, for instance, Jesus taught any who would listen the meaning and force and significance of his death. If he hadn't taught them the significance of his death, they would assume that his death meant no more than the deaths of the two criminals crucified alongside him, no more than the deaths of miscreants whom the state executes. Not only would people not take home the correct meaning of our Lord's activity, they would certainly take home the wrong meaning. Now there's a story about Francis of Assisi that warms many hearts. It may or may not be a true story, but in any case it's a story I don't like. It's, in fact, the story is so gosh awful, it's so bad, that I'm convinced it's apocryphal, can't be factual. Well now you all want to hear the story. One day a fellow friar said to Francis, let's let's preach to the city of Assisi. And Francis said, fine, but before we start to preach, let's walk throughout the length and the breadth of the city. 
away they went. When they had finished walking throughout the length of the city, the younger friar said, but Francis, Francis, when do we get to preach? We just did. Francis is supposed to have said, we just did. Oh, it's a sugar-sweet romantic story, drinking, dripping with saccharine sentimentality, but it's only half true. The half-truth, of course, is that the preacher's utterance and the preacher's life ought to be consistent. Good. But no person's life, not even a saint's, not even Jesus Christ's, unambiguously declares the gospel. If Christ's life had unambiguously declared the gospel, why on earth would he have bothered to preach? I'm out. I need all the help I can get. All's well that ends. We're coming. We're coming. Now, the mistake Francis is supposed to have made in Italy, Mother Teresa never made in India. When Mother Teresa was awarded a Nobel Prize, a Yugoslavian, Yugoslavian journalist asked Mother Teresa, she was Yugoslavian herself, asked her why she rescued throwaway babies from garbage cans in Calcutta every night. Mother Teresa didn't say, do you have to ask why? She didn't say, isn't why I do it obvious? The meaning and motive of everything I'm about, isn't it simply self-evident? Instead, she replied in her tough, straight-from-the-shoulder, trademark manner, Mother Teresa, you know, four foot ten was tougher than shoe leather. She said, Mr. I rescue throwaway babies for one reason. Jesus loves me. No, to be sure, it was only a one-sentence reply. Nonetheless, she knew she had to say something to interpret her action to the journalist. We always have to be taught. We have to be taught answers to life questions in as much as the answers are important, crucial, in fact. And if the answers are crucial, so are the questions. Think of the questions, at least some of them. Question, who is God? Well, he's the creator. Scripture, however, says very, very little about God as creator. Very little. Now, I'm impressed by the fact that the whole universe, 14.5 billion light years, you know, wide in all dimensions, is created from nothing. I think this is significant. Scripture says very little about it. Scripture goes on page after page after page about the search for a suitable wife for Isaac. Why? Now, I know what the smart people here are going to say. It's easier to fashion the whole universe out of nothing than it is to find a suitable spouse. That's what you're going to say. <laughs> Who is God? He's the creator. For every word that scripture pronounces about God as creator, it pronounces 50 words about God as destroyer. Have you ever heard a sermon on God the destroyer? Question, why is it that Jesus describes his most intimate followers as possessed of but the tiniest faith, the pipsqueakiest faith? Question, why do Christians regard as normative for faith and life an Older Testament that's four times longer than the newer? Why do we need the older at all? What would happen if we set it aside? What has happened in the history of the church when we've set it aside? Question, why is it that the only physical description the apostles give us of our Lord? Do you know what it is? The apostles don't tell us whether Jesus was tall or short or skinny or fat or blonde-eyed or blue-haired or blue-eyed or blonde-haired or anything else. They never bother. They tell us only one thing about him in this regard. He was circumcised. Now, what kind of a portrait are you going to paint with that much information? <laughs> Do you know why they tell us this? Because they maintain it doesn't matter a fig to your faith whether he was tall or short, skinny or fat, blue-eyed or blonde-haired, but it matters everything to your faith in mind that our Lord was and is a son of Israel. Question. Why did our Hebrew foreparents regard idolatry, murder, and adultery as the three most heinous sins? Why do we modern degenerates regard murder as criminal, adultery as trivial, idolatry as nothing at all, and none of them as sin? 
Jesus assumed that truth isn't self-evident. Jesus assumed, in other words, that the meaning of the most obvious event isn't itself obvious at all. Therefore, Jesus assumed that we always have to be taught. And the congregation is a school in which Christ's people are taught. In the third place, the congregation is also an army that fights. Christians today aren't ready to hear this. We don't mind being a nursery or a school, but we don't want to be an army, an army that fights. Aren't we followers of the Prince of Peace? Aren't we called to be peacemakers? I have noticed that those who are repelled by any suggestion that the congregation as an army are repelled by the notion of fighting. I have noticed too, however, that the same people who abhor any Christian reference to fighting will fight instantly if IRS gets their income tax assessment wrong or is suspected of getting it wrong. They will fight instantly if their youngster is awarded a low grade on a school project. They will fight instantly as soon as they hear that their employer has plans to alter working conditions or compensation or holidays. After all, their cause is right, isn't it? And it has to be righteous. How much more is at stake when the truth of Jesus Christ collides with the falsehoods of the evil one? How much more is at stake when someone is victimized and rendered a casualty in the midst of that spiritual warfare she was never even aware of, or perchance was aware of? No wonder Paul picks up the metaphor of soldiering and urges the congregation in Ephesus to put on the whole armor of God, shield, shoes, sho uh, breastplate, sword, helmet. There's nothing God-honoring about being an unnecessary victim. No wonder, too, that Paul reminds young Timothy that soldiering entails hardship, sacrifice, single-mindedness, training in godliness, no wonder he gathers it all up by urging the young man always to fight the good fight of the faith. We can't fight unless we have first trained. Training. Many church folk today see no point to training just because they see nothing Christian in fighting. They think that conflict is always and everywhere sub-Christian because unloving. And they are wrong. In the first place, our Lord leaves us no choice. If we're going to be disciples and we're going to be soldiers in that conflict which erupts the moment his flag of truth is planted in the citadel of an unbelieving world. Since the master was immersed in conflict every day, Jesus was immersed in conflict every day, what makes his followers think they won't be or shouldn't be? In the second place, those who regard all conflict as sub-Christian because unloving fail to see that spiritual conflict arises on account of love's energy. God is love. Jesus is the incarnation of God's nature. Jesus is knee-deep in conflict every day just because love is resisted every day. Love is contradicted every day. Love is bushwhacked and savaged every day. What kind of love is it that won't persist in the face of opposition? won't contend to vindicate the slandered and relieve the oppressed, won't fend off every effort of lovelessness to victimize and abandon. Love that won't persist and contend, love that refuses to fight is simply no love at all. In the third place, the most loved-filled heart knows that there is a place for godly resistance. I'm talking now about godly resistance. I'm not talking about crankiness or ill temper or petulance. When Martin Luther, grief-stricken at the horrible abuses in the church of his day and grief-stricken still more at the subversion of the gospel, when Luther finally stopped weeping and decided to do something, he discussed what he planned to do with Professor Jerome Scherf of Wittenberg University. Scherf was professor in the faculty of law. He was one of the brightest stars in the Wittenberg University firmament. <clears throat> professor Jerome Scherf agreed with Luther that the abuses were dreadful and the compromised gospel deplorable. Scherf, however, was aghast at what Luther planned to do. Don't do that, he cried. You'll render us all targets. We'll all be in trouble here in Wittenberg. The authorities will never put up with it. And if they have to put up with it, said Luther, if they have to, 
Now, to live in the company of Jesus Christ is never to go looking for a fight. To live in the company of Jesus Christ is never to relish conflict for the sake of conflict, but it is to share his conflict. To live in the company of Jesus Christ is to share love's struggle in the face of unlove's militancy. Lastly, the congregation is a hospital for the wounded. When the Apostle Paul discusses the different ministries to be exercised in any one congregation, he mentions healing, 1 Corinthians 12. If healing is to be exercised within the congregation, then the congregation's a hospital. We must be sure to understand that there's no shame in being hospitalized just because there's no shame in being wounded. The fact that we are wounded simply confirms the truth, truth that we are soldiers in Christ's army and have recently been on the front lines. Spiritual conflict is no less debilitating than any other kind. Now, one military facility for the battle worn is the Rest and Recreation Center. R&R centers are not merely for military personnel who have broken a leg or fractured a skull. R&R centers principally accommodate those who have been under immense stress, are frazzled, and need to move behind the front lines for a while in order to recuperate. During World War II, all submarine crews were given as much time off to recuperate as they spent on patrol. A month-long patrol at sea in an underwater iron coffin was always followed by a month's rest ashore. Nobody ever suggested that there was something shameful in the men's need for rest. Rest. Jesus invites us, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Rest, however, has special force in scripture. Rest in scripture doesn't have the modern sense of vegging, sheer inactivity. Rest, ever since the fall in Genesis 3, rest has to do with restoration. Come to me, all who are bone weary and worn down and frazzled and fractured and frantic. Come to me, because with me there is restoration. We should note that our Lord's winsome invitation, come unto me. Gosh, is there any invitation more inviting in Scripture than that? It isn't an invitation at all. Look at the grammatical form of it. It's in the imperative mood. It's a command. You come. You come right now. Plainly, it's an imperative. He commands us to come to him for restoration. To say that it's a command is to say there's no option here. We must go to him for restoration just because he knows that his soldiers are beaten up and once beaten up aren't much use until restored. In other words, providing hospital care for Christ's wounded is as much the congregation's ministry to the congregation as is being a nursery where newborns are nurtured and a school where learners are taught and an army where soldiers are trained and in which they fight the good fight of the faith until that day when we say with the apostle, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Would you stand for the benediction, please? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.